Hey, ladies. How's everybody today? Let me get this all cleared off of here. Um, I am grateful that Lori shared that prayer request or that prayer about the um, Heroic Media uh, luncheon today, I think it, it, it's very interesting. Pan, Planned Parenthood International is having their awards lunch today. And at the same time, Heroic Media is having this luncheon for life today. And um, just how timely that is. And as I've shared with you all today, uh, probably uh, many times that I've spoken, but as I've shared with you in the past, um, had abortion been legal in 1957, um, I may not be here. And I'm so grateful, grateful to my mom um, and my dad, and, and grateful that um, God chose to give me life, even if the cart came before the horse, that was the plan. Um, it isn't always easy, and things are not always neat and tidy. But that doesn't mean we scrap the whole thing and start over and do it right. Sometimes we pick up the thing that looks like it's wrong and we trust it to Jesus to make it right and to do with what he always intended to do. And there's probably, I know there are women in this room who have um, suffered the pain of abortion, who have um, struggled with um, a, a pregnancy before marriage, and I am here to tell you, Jesus loves you. Jesus has a plan for everything that has happened in your life. He wastes nothing. He forgives everything that is given to him to forgive. You have not done the one thing that is unforgivable. You have not done the one thing. You're not the one person that Jesus cannot forgive. He loves you. He loves you fiercely, so much so that he bled and died for us on that gorgeous cross at Calvary. So I want to... um, uh, have light on my table, but I don't. But <laughs> I know y'all probably think sister needs to get some glasses or something because she can never see. But the fact is, when we did it back there, I had more light shining on me, and when I do it up here, I don't. So I brought this little magnifier page thing. So if I start going like this, you'll know why. Because I just don't hit a. It's fine. This is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm good. Um, it just sounds like I've never read the passage before when I'm kind of like, look at the words. I'm like, I did, I did practice. <laughs> anyway, I'm so excited about this um, lesson today. And I, if, if um, technology hiccups and technology problems are any indication that um, the enemy is trying to get you um, baffled and disheveled and, and all of that and just flustered, um, because what you're going to teach, well, will that happen? And so I won't go into all the technology um, that went awry, but I will say this. I'm so excited about this lesson. It's simple, maybe and basic and practical as it is. I really believe that uh, this lesson is going to change somebody's life, if not everybody's life, everybody's rudder, just tweak ever so slightly and send you in a different direction. I believe it because it changed my life learning the concepts that I'm going to pass along to you today and helping you to understand and to actually practically do it. And I believe that there are women in this room who have been in Bible studies a long, long time, maybe most of their life, but who have never actually put this to practice. And this could also be um, such a tremendous breakthrough and change and difference maker for you. So whether you've been a long time in the Word of God or just a little while in the Word of God, I think we all have something to gain from this today. I think we all have something that is going to prove to be tremendously, profoundly impactful to our own spiritual lives and help us to flourish even more. And so if you have a free hand, if you're not eating just yet and you want to turn to Isaiah 55, I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 55. And I'm going to start reading in, um, yes, verse 6 of Isaiah 55. And this is the word of the Lord, and we love it. And seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the, mag- and the, mi- I'm sorry, and the unrighteous man turn from his um, thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The, the, um, the NET says he will lavish you with forgiveness. Somebody needs to know today that they are lavished with forgiveness. God does, is not stingy with forgiveness. 
He has lavished his forgiveness. He has abundantly pardoned, and we need to know that. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Basically what he's saying to us is, you can't outthink me, you can't outdo me. What looks like the right thing to do or the more logical thing to do is probably not the way I'm going to do it, so you need to trust me that because I've been down the road and I can see the end from the beginning, my ways are not only higher, my thoughts are not only higher, but they're better. I have a better yes. That's what he's saying to us. So right now, where do you need God's truth and God's word in your life? Think about that. So he goes on to say in, in verse 10, <clears throat> For as the, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread for the eater, so shall my word be like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I cannot see. So shall, my, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I send it. So he's saying as the rain comes down and the snow comes down from heaven, and rain and snow don't go back up, they come down with a purpose. They come down with a purpose to water the earth. They do not return without watering the earth, accomplishing the purpose God send it down, sent it down for, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. That's the same concept that we get the word flourish from, making it bud, bring forth something and sprout. We get flourish from that. Um, so shall my word, so just like that comes down and has a purpose, he says, so shall my word. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and you shall be led forth in peace and the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth in singing and all of the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar or the thistles shall come up the myrtle and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall be on it. It shall make a name for the Lord. So whatever he's doing and it's going out, it's returning, not void. It's accomplishing the purpose for the one purpose of making a name for the Lord. So part of the big purpose in our life of sowing the seed of God's word into our life and living our lives in a way that flourishes to the glory of God is so that God's name is known, so that God is revealed, so that we see God, so we see Jesus in us. So, what I like, want to say about this is that the, the true success, the true fruitfulness, the true, the true um, flourishing of our life is directly linked to the word of God that is sown into our life. There's a direct correlation between fruitfulness and the Word of God coming in. Fruitfulness in our life and the Word of God being sown into our life are directly linked, directly connected. God's Word says then in Isaiah, He tells us um, that His Word is not void or empty. It accomplishes. It has accomplishing power. Um, it's living and active. Hebrews 4.12 tells us it's living and active. Um, Isaiah goes on to say that it, it produces something, it's fruitful, it produces something, it's effective, it gets results, it's sex, successful, it's prosperous, and God wants us to prosper and be successful in the things that are spiritual, in the things of our soul. And that's what he's saying to us here, that's what my word can do for you, spiritual prosperity, spiritual success. God's word always does what he tells it to do because God always does what he says he will do. Amen. He always, always, always does what he says. And it, it says here, his word goes, my word goes out from my mouth and it accomplishes. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to wonder. We have to trust that the way he chooses to accomplish is going to be the best, 
It's going to be a better yes. Mary and Martha asked Jesus to come when their brother was sick and then their brother died and they said, you didn't come. They asked God for a healing. They got a miracle. They asked for a healing. They got a resurrection. God said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going to heal. I got a better yes. I've got a better yes. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Where has he done the better yes in your life? It might have been a better yes that broke your heart, but somehow, some way, in his plans and in his um, dreams and in his purposes, it is a better yes because he can see the end from right here. He knows how it all works out. God's word always does what it says it will do because God always does what he says he will do, his purpose. And that means good and pleasing, not just some torturous, yank you around by a chain and make you get down on your knees and do all of this religious stuff. His purposes for us are good. His plans for us are good. He watches over his word to perform it, and it does exactly what he says it will do. It is not without purpose. It is not without power. Every word of his has accomplishing power built into the word. It's up to the person to to reach up, grab the word, take it into their life, and use it. Remember we said good soil hears, receives, takes it in, and does something with it. It's much like a quarterback in a football game. If you're, if you're into football at all, you probably just at least know a little bit that a quarterback throws the football. And every football a quarterback throws, unless he's just not playing with a full deck, every football pass he throws, he intends for it to make a touchdown or to gain some ground. He intends for it to be caught or received by his team and so that his team member can run across the goal. Every pass he throws is intended to reach the goal and, and, and score a touchdown. Would you agree? Not every pass makes it. Sometimes we're tackled. Sometimes we, we fumble the ball. and Sometimes somebody intercepts the ball and all of that. But what would happen if he threw the ball And the receiver caught the ball and just stood there with it and said, I've got the ball, here's the ball, I've got the ball, but never took the ball and did what was supposed to happen with the ball, which is to run down that field and cross over the end zone and score a touchdown. God's word always scores a touchdown. God's word sown into your life will always produce what he intended for it to produce. Are you tracking with me? Does this make sense? God's word always does it. It's the only thing we can trust. It's why I've asked you for a period of time to put down devotionals and other people's inspirational and encouraging words and pick up the living and active words of God. I said this the first week. We love Jesus' calling. I just don't think we love the gospel of John and us. If we can't live without that devotional, then we're really tracking the wrong way. I want you to get used to hearing God's word because God's word can change you. My words can encourage you. Uh, Sarah Young's words can encourage you. Um, Oswald Chambers' words can encourage you, and they can spur you on, and they can help you to run the distance. But the only words that can change you, the only words that are living and active, can have an effect on your life and profoundly change your life are God's words. They're God's words, and his words are good. And we can develop an appetite for his word by taking more of it in and giving more of it out. Sowing it, sowing it, sowing it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So God is the sower. In that passage in Isaiah, it says that he is the sower that sows the seed. So God sows the seed. He's always sowing and scattering his word. His word is always going out through the gospel being preached, through sound biblical teaching, through, um, through equipping and training through the Word of God and through women like you and me who love God and love His Word and take it into our lives and apply it to our lives, use it, put it to work, and then share it with someone else, help somebody else. Isaiah 54 and 5 says, The Sovereign Lord has appointed me to be His spokesperson he is, he, so that I may know a word to sustain the weary. Most mornings I ask him for that. Lord, um, you have appointed me to be your spokesperson. He's appointed each of you to be a spokesperson. So give me a word to sustain the weary. Sometimes I'm the weary one. But I'm going to tell you, every single time he gives me something, i got somebody I can pass it along to, somebody I can encourage with it, somebody I can sew it back into. My life, my circumstances, my relationship with him, my relationship with others, 
my relationship with a new believer. I've got something I can do with it. I take it in myself and I sow it. He says, it becomes seed for the sower and bread for the eater. It becomes seed for the sower. His word is what? The seed, right? Becomes seed. Seed for the sower turns into grain. It has, something has to happen for it to it in order for it to turn to grain and all of that. Then we get some nourishment. Bread for the eater. Some nourishment. God's word is nourishment to us. His word is nourishment to us. So you're a sower, I'm a sower. We are sowers. He's asking us to take the word, the reliable and viable word of God, the living and active word of God, um, taught, caught, grabbed, received, and responded to, and reproduced. He's asking us to, to take that in and to sow it into, sow God's truth back into my own relationship with God. I mean, when we open our Bibles and we read what God says, it's not just a studious academic pursuit. He designed it so that, so that we would come to know Him. He wants relationship with us. So, so as I'm reading this, it's not just reading it to read it, it's dialogue. If this is God's Word to me and I'm listening to it, if we're talking, if LJ and I are talking and we're having a conversation and she's doing all the talking and I'm just listening and I never respond, how awkward would that be? Just awkward. Just awkward. And God wants us to respond even if it's, I do not understand what I just read. I do not get it. I do not get it. I want to get it, but I don't get it. Or, God, I do not know how you can call yourself just if this happens, if this kind of thing happens. And then you say, show me, show me. And you let him show you and you let him speak and you let him teach. And it may not happen right that very minute, but it'll happen. He'll come back to you. He'll come back to you at a time when you can receive whatever he has for you. So his word is good. When we sow his word into the soil of our life, when we sow it into our relationships, it produces something. Sow it back into your relationship with God. Take his word where he says, um, the heavens declare the, the glory of God, the greatness of God. What is that, like Psalm 19 or something? Well, tell him, Lord, the heavens declare your greatness. I want to be aware and, and, and so conscious of your greatness on a daily basis. I'm telling you, this, this exercise of, of turning off social media for 21 days has really helped me live a more conscious life. Anybody in here feel the same? More conscious. I mean, like even more conscious just like walking around my house. Like how many of us are like, I I know somebody, I know people that got killed, you know, just scrolling and crossing streets and hit by cars. You know, so just conscious. I just have more of a conscious awareness of God. I have more of a consciousness about um, my, with my relationship with my husband. I told you all that last week. And just consciousness in general, when we dial down all that noise. So I'm sowing it into my life. It just makes good sense to me, and it ought to to you too. It just makes good sense that if I'm going to improve my life in some way, if I'm going to grow in my faith, that I ought to use words that work, that really have some power in them. I ought to use that first. That ought to be my first go-to. But do we do that? Do we go there? But let's go there today. Let's let's. Make this the focus of our lesson today, which is to, to really develop, to really find a faith that works by sowing the Word of God into our lives and having that flourish into a life that produces a hundredfold harvest. So I'm going to pray real quick again, and then we're going to dive into the Scripture. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for your truth. It is truly light for our um, feet and a lamp for our path. We love you, Lord. We love your Word, and we just want you to open our hearts today so that we can receive it. Father, help us to be great receivers today with um, sticky hands to grab onto your word and to bring it in and to sow it into our lives, Father. Um, I pray, God, um, a hedge of protection around the women in this room to guard them from the enemy who's trying to whisper something else into their head, who's trying to distract them or disturb them in some way. And I pray, God, that they'd be so present with you and that you would be present with them in a way that they can feel it. I pray you sanctify my mouth, sanctify my words, Lord, that um, everything um, I say and do today would be captured, captivated by you, and be so pleasing in your sight, Father. 
you are my rock. You are my redeemer. I cannot do this life without you, nor do I want to. And I ask you all of these things in the saving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the passage of scripture that we have been looking at these past two weeks is from um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel in the parable of the soils. Some, some Bibles say the parable of the sower. It can be both. The focus of that passage, we looked at Mark 4, 8, and I'm going to read it to you in the Message Bible. It's at the top of your handout. Some seed fell on good earth and came up with a flourish, circle that word flourish, producing a harvest, exceeding her wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? The Message Translation says it that, but that way, and I love it. So, so our, our focus is like, what, what is a flourishing life, and how do I get my life to really flourish? The biblical definition for flourish, we said, was to be fully functioning and thriving. Those are your first blanks there. Fully functioning and thriving in that particular place where you have the greatest influence for Christ on the planet. To be fully functioning and thriving. Let me just tell you briefly what I, what I, what I mean by that. Fully functioning. It's to function as a follower of Christ. To function as Christ intended us to follow. And again... Sitting in the church pew isn't going to, to help us to function as a Christian unless we're actually hearing the Word of God and applying it to our lives. And you probably think, she is a broken record because all she ever talks about is the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That and go make disciples, pretty much my two, my two uh, mantras. Because we need to know the Word of God if we're going to thrive and we're going to flourish. There is no thriving and flourishing apart from the Word of God. There is no living a successful and profoundly spiritual successful life to the glory of God apart from the Word of God. There's no fulfilling your your ministry, your particular gifting will die on the vine apart from the Word of God. He says, abide in me and let my words abide abide in you and you will bear fruit, much fruit, fruit to my glory. We can't do it apart from him. We can't do it apart from his word. It's so easy to pick up a book. It's so easy to pick up a devotional. It's so easy to listen to something and not actually get some dirt behind my nails and dig into God's word myself. But that's what I want for me. That's what I want for you. And you got to pray to have that. Pray for that hunger. Take his word in. Give it away. The more you give away, the more you get. To the measure you give it out, it will be given back to you. The more you hear it, the more you take it in and use it, the more understanding you will get. So we have the sower, and we already said that's God, and anyone who preaches or teaches the Word or shares the Word of God with another person, that's the sower. That's the sower. And the seed is the what? The Word of God. Seed is the Word of God. And then we have four Soils, which represented what? A con- heart condition. So a condition of our heart. And let me just say that when we think of heart, we're not thinking of the, the thing that's keeping us alive, the beat, beat, beat heart. We're thinking of heart in a biblical sense, which is the seat of our mind, our will, and our emotions. That's what the heart is, our mind, our will, and our emotions. So when we think about sowing the seed into the soil of our heart, it's sowing it into our life, our very life. So we've got a hard heart, and that was what kind of a heart? The hard heart was what? Unresponsive. The heart that was just blocked to the Word of God. And we said that a lot of times we can get a hard heart by hearing the Word of God so much that we, and not responding to it that we become hardened to it. It's just falling on deaf ears after a while. The shallow heart had no root. It had a little bit of soil over a lot of rock, had no root, and so when trouble came, it just withered up and died. It just blew away. We had an infested, crowded heart caught up in the cares of the world, um, the riches of pleasure. The Im- it was a distracted, a very distracted heart, immature, not in fruit-bearing. I'm sure that at this point, many of you are familiar with the name Brian Cullinan. Anybody? Brian Cullinan. Yes. If you happen to watch the Academy Awards, read anything about the Academy Awards, you'll know that there's a gentleman who worked for Pricewaterhouse who gave the wrong envelope to Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, and they announced the wrong winner in the category of Best Motion Picture because Brian Cullinan, he'd be tweeting a picture. He on Twitter when he handed the envelope, wrong envelope. He was distracted. Everyone say he was distracted, and his name will now go down in 
Infamy. Everyone say it again. Infamy. I do not want to be known for, for the person that was distracted and caused blah, blah, blah. You know? So, anyway, I mean, really, I love when, when, uh, current events help illustrate my lesson. So, so thank you for that. So, if we're going to have a life that flourishes, we're going to have, and a life that is beyond our wildest dreams, we're going to have to do something that creates that good heart, and that good heart was the, the, the heart that um, received the word and took it in and responded to it, ran with it, ran the thing down the, down the, um, the football field and, and scored with it. Good soil receives, responds, runs with it, and reproduces. It re- always reproduces something. So if I'm going to have a life that flourishes, and you're going to have, and make it personal, a life that flourishes, you're going to have to do a few things. And we're on the third thing today, but the first two, we're going to have to pay attention to God's Word. We're going to have to receive God's Word. And today we're going to talk about we're going to have to respond to God's Word. We're going to have to respond to it. We're going to have to put it to use in our life. And I made it personal for you. I'm going to have to respond to God's Word and put it to use in my life. Because faith that works is a faith that flourishes. And when we use God's Word, it produces more faith in us. You know, I want to I want to clarify that a flourishing life, a flourishing faith, does not happen when everything is all rosy and hunky dory. In fact, it's quite the opposite. When the seed is scattered, it falls on different soil. Even when it fell on the good soil, the good earth, it received it. There had to be some plowing in order for that to really go down deep. The plowing happens after the seed is scattered. So I started thinking about this this week, and I thought, when are the times that I have really flourished in my faith, really grown in my faith? They're the times when I've been plowed, when I've been plowed by hardship, heartache, pain, suffering, sickness, disappointment, discouragement. Those are the things that have have plowed my heart and caused me to flourish, and they're the reason I can get on my knees and thank God. I'm not yippy-skippy it happened, but I can thank him because I know him better because of that circumstance than I would have if that circumstance had never been allowed to touch my life. So we can be flourishing even with a broken heart. We can be fully functioning and thriving and having an influence for Christ in the middle of our pain and our brokenness and in the middle of our sickness, in the middle of our addiction recovery. Your life preaches no matter what you're going through. And when you keep sowing the Word of God in your life and hanging on to Him for dear life, people are watching your life and they're saying, "Ah, okay, now I see. Now I see what this means. I see how it works because I see it in her life. I see it in his life. I didn't understand this before, but I, I can actually see what this says. and I see living proof of it in her. We all probably know somebody we've seen walk through something horrific, something heartbreaking, something extraordinarily challenging, and said, wow, gosh, what a a heartache. But look at her life. Not only is she living, breathing, still opening her eyes every day, but like she's dressed. Like she's loving on people. Like she's taking care of her kids. Like she's... You know, going after it again, just loving Jesus and following hard after Him. The hardship in life, God just does not waste a cotton-picking thing. He uses it to keep plowing deeper and deeper and deeper into the soil of our heart. And so here's something I want to make. This point I want to make, I want you to know, I want you to believe with everything you got in the little gray square on your, on your page, in that space. There is no woman more victorious, no woman more threatening, to the enemy than a woman who knows God's Word and uses it. There is no woman more victorious. There is no woman more threatening to the enemy than a woman who knows God's Word and uses it and uses it. Again, there is this um, the, the true success in our life. You can see that there's this, um, biblically speaking, there's a direct link to the Word of God sown into our life and the fruitfulness, the effectiveness, and the success 
in our life, the success of our spiritual life. It's not just knowing the word or knowing about God or, or even knowing a verse by heart. It's knowing it by life. Like, I know what this says, and I've memorized this verse. But I think in first, uh, let's say, Second uh, Timothy 1, um, 7. Um, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And some translations say of, of self-discipline or self-control. I think the New King James and the King James say a sound mind. He has not given us a spirit of fear or intimidation or timidity, but of power and love and sound mind. Well, I, will, I, I want to tell you that as much as Jesus Christ has saved my life on that cross, his word saved my mind. I got a sound mind. Because there was a time in my life when I literally thought I was nuts, going nuts, had been there back and gone back again nuts. And so, as funny and crazy as that sounds, and I've said this to you all, there were nights, I mean, I'm not saying this works. I mean, I was so desperate, I put my head on my Bible and fell asleep opened my Bible and just, just threw it down on my Bible. And anything, anything I read, I just, put, I just tried to work it into the, the fiber of my life. And, I, I mean, I really credit the little bit of sanity I'm showing up here today with that, with God's Word. I am just so behind time here. Okay, let's, let's move. Let's, let's hustle. Okay, so faith, we said, so let's get practical then with this. We said, um, all along we said that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. Okay, the the, the enemy wants to mess with our faith. He wants to jack with our faith because he'd rather have you have a weak, watered down, unflourishing faith and just kind of a perfunctory go to church, um, check off the the spiritual to-do list kind of faith. He doesn't really want you living and active in your faith. And so that, that's why he wants to distract us because faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God in Hebrews 11.6 11.6 tells us it is impossible to please God without faith. So there's some correlation with all of that. Faith comes through hearing and hearing of the words of Christ, and it is impossible, Hebrews 11.6, and without faith it is impossible to please God. It's not just like it's not easy to please God, it's difficult, it's challenging, it's not possible. So let's, let's, let's call it what, it what it is when we look at that verse, it tells us what about faith? This is not, it, well, now what does it actually say there? No, what does it actually say there? What, okay, we're going to observe. Everybody say observe. We're going to observe. Observe is I'm looking at something and I'm telling you what's there. Not what I think is there or what I, what I would like to be there. It's this is what is there. If you walk up to a crime scene like a detective and very thoughtfully you look the situation over and you take notes of what everything is. We like to skip from what's there to what we want it to say. We want to skip from observation to interpretation and application and therefore we never really look and let the weight of the word fall on us. It says about faith what? Without faith it's impossible. So it's impossible to please God. Okay, that's what it says. Yay! Okay, that's what it says. And then it says, for whoever would draw near to God must what? What does it say? Must believe believe that what? And? Okay, so if if, if, um, if you're going to please God, it says that whoever would draw near to God, I'm going to come to God, our first thing I have to do is believe. Okay? And then I have to believe that he exists and that he rewards. Not based on my good behavior. He is the reward. He doesn't reward based on my good behavior. He rewards because I come to him in faith and belief. And, P.S., those words are, are, they come from the same root word, which I'll go into in just a moment. So, the observation here is that without faith it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. And if I draw near to him, then I must believe that he exists and reward those who seek him. And believe is faith. So, observation, who is talking, what are they saying, what does the passage say about God, what does the passage say about me, and how am I going to respond? Based on this, how am I going to respond to the fact that it is impossible to please God without faith? How am I going to respond to that? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking at my life. 
How much of my life am I living by faith? How much of my life am I living by faith, taking what God says in His Word, sowing it into my life and walking it out, actually doing it? On your seats, everyone has a little heart with a scripture. And I'm going to ask you real quick like a bunny, pair up in twos, look at the person next to you, or if there's three of you on a row, three of you, share, share your verse, and what does it tell you? One thing, one thing. What does this verse tell you about God? Not what you think it says. What does it tell you about God? Share it with the person next to you. Real quick. Okay. Was that fun? Okay. Did did everybody find out something in your verse on your heart about God? One thing about God. Now, now what what your challenge is and what you're going to do with that um, precious, um, word is you're going to sow it into your heart, in your life this week. So whatever it says, and we have prayed over these, the whole leadership team, we wrote these out and prayed as we did and prayed over them today. And we believe that the, 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 the heart you got is the heart you get and the heart you're supposed to get. So, so I want you to take this and I want you to just get in and, and work it into your life. Sow it into your life. Sow it into your life. The Message Bible um, in uh, Matthew 7, in the Message Bible, it says that these words, when you work them into your life, become a foundation um, for you. And so we want you to work this into your life. Be praying it into your life. Maybe there's, there's a loved one that you need to be praying this, this for, praying this over. Yes. yes. She didn't get a heart. Who? <laughs> like, we, we have plenty extra hearts. We have plenty extra heart. Okay. Everybody make sure you have a heart before we leave. Okay. So that exercise that we did, I want to pitch this out to you. And it's something that Lori and I have talked about. We've, we've prayed about. What we would like, because there's just not enough time in an hour on, on a Wednesday, is once a month, if there's a desire, if there's a need for it, we would like to meet for a show her how kind of evening where we spend a couple of hours together digging into scripture, and also to train and equip us better. A lot of people don't know how to read their Bible or study their Bible or really get something out of it and start to see these kind of results. And so while I can only do a little bit for you right now, I would love the opportunity to spend more time once a month, and it would be something different each time. Maybe it's how to pray God's Word over your life. over your Maybe it's how to, um, how to pray, how to use a prayer journal. How to, how do you, what do you really do in a quiet time? How do you formulate a quiet time? How do you structure a quiet time? Um, uh, just the practical how-tos of, um, you know, I would call them disciplines, but everybody's going to wince when I say that word, but it really is. You know, it's just some things you do in order to get where you want to go. And I don't want to be in the same place spiritually a year from now, a week from now. I want to keep growing. And so if I want to keep growing, i got to look at some things. I mean, I hope and I pray that all of my doctors continue on with education as the years go on and that they're not doing like what they learned, you know, when they were um, interning. So um, we need to be learning. We always need to be learning. So I would love to do that, and we'll send that um, a little note out to you if you can indicate it on a pink card if you fill one of those out. But I would love, 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 love to spend that time with y'all. On the back, as Lori said, every week there has been... Um, kind of a structural informational on how to. Like, you know what? I really do want to start meeting with another girl. God bless you. I really do want to start um, meeting in a group so we can be iron that sharpens iron. But I really do want to start reaching out to somebody I know is young in her faith, new in her faith, that doesn't have a faith at all. And, and here's the structure for you. Here's tools to help you start sewing into your own life and into the, into the life of another. So you can go back and look at those. Um, from the previous week, you can go online and download them along with the lessons on the website. I want you to turn to Hebrews 11 if you're not already there, but that was the passage we were just looking at, and it's the passage about faith. Hebrews 11 is all about faith. You don't even need to guess what the theme is. You can go and circle how many times the word faith appears in the passage of Hebrews 11, and it's over 20 times. When there's any repetition in Scripture, that usually gives us a good indication of what the main theme of that passage of Scripture is. When there's repetition, look for words that are repeated. 
Look for words when you're reading the scripture for words that are repeated and make note of those. In this passage of scripture, faith is not a passive word. We see a great example, a great illustration here. Faith is not a passive word that just sits there and nods its head and mutters an amen. It's not an active, it's an active, a very vibrant, vital, active word that flexes its muscle. It gets down and does heavy lifting, if you will. That's what faith does. Faith, and if you circle the word um, in um, verse 6, belief and faith, if you go back up to verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When we look at that word faith and we look at that word belief, it also means the same as trust. Those three words mean the same. They come from the same root Greek word. That means um, uh, persuade, assurance, have confidence, to be confident. It means to commit to. Everybody say commit to. And it, and it has the um, a, a, a prefix in it that is um, that it means um, it's a place where action or motion precedes. And so here's the thing. Faith has to have some action to it. If I'm sowing the word of God in my life, something's got to show for it. My faith has to be active because if God's word is in me and it's living and active, it needs to be living and active through me. So Hebrews 11 gives us this actual working definition of faith, but then it also gives us all these examples. By faith Abraham, by faith Enoch, by faith Sarah, by faith Jacob, by faith Moses, and on and on and on and on, and by faith, by faith, by faith Rahab. And then it gets into all these people that they don't even name their names after a while. There's just so many people. There's experiences they went through. Every one of those is a concrete example that illustrates to us that in order for faith to be lived, faith, it has to be viable and visible. It has to be tangible and palpable. It has to be walked out one step at a time, one day at a time, in the real life, hard circumstances, on the real life, hot pavement of our lives. That's where it's meant to work, to be put to work. That's what we do with faith. We make it work. It has to be acted out or lived out. The acts of faith, that's what they're talking about here. If really, if you take that word, it would be not just by faith, but by an act of faith. By an act of faith. See, the Bible tells us that faith comes from hearing, Romans 10. The Bible says that faith without works is dead, James 2. 2 Corinthians, walk by faith. Share your faith, Philemon 1.6. Faith is tested, 1 Peter 1. The righteous shall live by faith, Galatians 3. So, faith is an act of, is an act of faith. And so the, that verse in 6, without an act of faith, it is impossible to please God. So how is faith acting itself out in your own line, life? What is the act of faith there? So we read here in Hebrews 11. Go back and read that passage this week. It's in your, uh, on the back. But we read there then that, that faith is, is getting the living and active words of God into the living and active me. Getting his word to be living and active in me and through me. So where is God's word living and active in your life, in your present circumstances now? Where is it? I wrote down a few things about faith working and how to do that. So in my relationship with God, that's the first place we're going to think about sowing it. I'm going to sow it back into my relationship with God. I gave you an example. But for instance, you, you get a passage of Scripture and there's nothing wrong with praying your own prayers, but God's words are living and active and we know that God's word is true and that it has power and accomplishing power in it. So I want it to accomplish something in me. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a passage of Scripture and I'm going to pray it back to him. I'm just going to give him back his own words and make it personal for me. If it's something that's a promise that was only a promise for like the nation of Israel or a specific person, I'm going to say, Lord, you did this for the nation of Israel. Lord, you did this for Moses. I ask that you will do that for me. I ask that you will do that for my family. I ask, Lord, in my relationship with you, give me supernatural, all-consuming love for you. 
Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, give me a supernatural, all-consuming love for you. Lord, tell me in your word. You tell me in your word that it is impossible to please you without faith. Help my faith. Help my unbelief. Help me to trust you. Because you are the only trustworthy source for everything in my life. Help me to trust you. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better. The heavens declare your majesty. I'm going to sow the word of God back into my relationship with God. I'm going to tell God how great he is because he's already told me how great he is. I'm just going to tell him right back. You're so great. This is what you say about yourself. Your your love is unfailing. This is who you are. You're merciful. You're good. You're kind. You're just. You're all powerful. I'm going to tell him exactly what he has already told me about himself. It's going to deepen and strengthen my relationship. I'm going, to, I'm going to sow God's Word into the circumstances of my own life, into myself, and into others. Um, in a health crisis, financial struggles, loss of job, marriage struggles, raising my children, addictions, and on and on, broken hearts, on and on. Lord, you have promised in your Word that you will never leave me or forsake me. And when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me and you will comfort me. And I need you to comfort me now because this is as close to death valley as I've ever been. I need it. I need it. And you pray it and you pray your guts out and you pray and you pray and you keep on praying because I will tell you, something will change. Something will change. You may not get the yes you wanted, but you will get a better yes. According to your word right here in First Peter 5, 7, I am casting all my cares and my anxiety on you, especially the burden of this loved one, on you because you care for me, you care for this loved one, and you care about my circumstances, and it's just way too big for me. Casting it on you. Lord, this is a mighty big saying I am facing, and according to your word, I am praying as Jehoshaphat did in 2 Chronicles 20, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you and they are in your word and I'm going to believe what you tell me to do. I will believe you are as you say you are. I will believe you as Jehoshaphat did and I will praise you and I will thank you, Lord. And you pray it out. And you breathe it in and you breathe it out and you breathe it in and you breathe it out until it becomes part of your gray matter, until it just becomes the essence of who you are. I'm going to sow it into my relationship with others, in my marriage, my family, my friends, my coworkers. Lord, I am scratchy with my husband again. I ask that you will help me to maintain that quiet and gentle spirit that you find so attractive and pleasing that it talks about in 1 Peter 3. Help me to hear you and keep my mouth shut and pray instead of say. Pray instead of say is a word for somebody in this room today. Pray instead of say. Lord, I am at your mercy. This marriage is impossible, but I know that you are the God of miracles and that nothing is impossible for you. And I need, we need a miracle. Somebody needs to pray that today over their marriage. Lord, I ask that my son, my daughter, would come to know you and love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and to fear you, Lord, for that is the start of wisdom. And I want them to live wisely, Lord, and to not make mistakes. Lord, I ask that my son or that my daughter would come to know you and love you. I ask that they would be sold out followers of Jesus Christ who make disciples for Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive me for trying to control things to work the way I want and I want to see them work. Your thoughts and ways are so much higher than mine, and I ask you to work out the plan you've thought of for this loved one. Lord, help my unbelief in my role at work, in the work of Christ in the world. Lord, I ask that you make me extraordinarily fruitful, according to John 15, and that my life would bear much fruit, much fruit that will last to your great glory. Are we praying that way? I probably come across a little melodramatic, but I'm going to tell you, I've had to get melodramatic. The volume of my prayers, uh, the intensity of my prayers doesn't get my prayers answered any faster, any quicker, or any more the way I want them to. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's just so much in me that I've got to yell at somebody, and, and he can take it. I've got to get melodramatic, and he can take it. 
I don't want drama and I don't want to, I don't, I don't want center stage. I'm not always asking him, Lord, steal my show. Steal my show. It's all about you. But I'm going to get melodramatic. I'm going to get, I'm just going to get passionate. Because he's passionate. And that's how he created me. And there's a time when my prayers are quiet and whispers or just internal. And there's a time when my prayers are saturated with salty tears. And there's a time when my prayers are covered, excuse me, with snot running out of my nose and words I cannot even utter something that sounds like an audible word from the English language. But he knows what I'm saying. He has a heart reader like no other. He is a heart lover. Nobody loves you. Nobody knows your heart more than Jesus does. Does Nobody can read you like Jesus. He knows what you're saying. Even if all you can do is sob and gasp and hold your breath and choke and cry and fling yourself in reckless abandon into the arms of the one who created you in his love and loves you like crazy and will never let you go and has a plan and a purpose that is good for your life. What are you currently doing and how are you currently living by an act of faith? What's your faith story? I want you to turn, look at them at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 41. And someone read it to me. Hebrews 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 41. Hebrews 11. And on your page, I want you to fill in 41. Oh, there's no 41? Oh, but there is. On your page, I want you to write Hebrews in real big bold, 41. Here's what Hebrews 41 is. By an act of faith, I, Punky Tolson, have. By an act of faith, I, Alyssa Reed, have. By an act of faith, I, Jill Giddens, have. By an act of faith, I and Blakeney am doing what to the glory of God? You see, these are examples for us to follow. These are examples for us to imitate. This is action for us to put into action in our own life. It works. It works. And you are part of the story. Your story starts with verse 41. In your Bibles, I want you to write verse 41. By faith, I, in your name, did what? By an act of faith, I waited for God's best man for me. By an act of faith, I stayed married. By an act of faith, I overcame my addiction to whatever your addiction is. By an act of faith, I battled cancer. I battled depression. I forgave the person who offended me, abused me, neglected me, cheated on me, lied to me, left me, hurt me. By an act of faith, I forgave the person who broke my heart, ignored me, shamed me, insulted me, never came through for me. By an act of faith, I can learn to love my spouse again. By an act of faith, I can parent my child. By an act of faith, I can love my prodigal. By an act of faith, I can be faithful. By an act of faith, I will stop comparing myself and will love the me God created me to be. By an act of faith, By many continuous and scary and risky steps and acts of faith, I will follow Jesus. I will deny myself daily. I will take up my cross and I will follow him and I will do what he tells me to do. No matter where you are in your faith, no matter what the condition of the soil in your heart is right this very moment, no matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, how long you've been serving the Lord, would you be willing to recommit your heart afresh to Him right now, today? And would you be willing to commit to having a daily, personal, quiet time with Him from now until Easter? Could you do that? You don't have to give me a response. Could you do that? Could you do that and would you do that? On your way out, um, you're going to be handed a card like this, and it's got three commitments on it. The one I just asked you to commit to go- yourself to God again, just to recommit to Him. The second thing I want you to consider, and we're going to talk about this next week as we wind this lesson up, is to commit yourself to the family of God. Some of you are in groups among the family of God, believers. Just commit yourself to one or two or three other women that you meet with weekly, 
for the purpose of sharpening one, one, one another's iron and building up and encouraging faith in one another weekly from now until Easter. The third commitment is committing yourself to the work of Christ in the world. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. There's a lot of lost out there. There's a lot of seekers out there. There are a lot of people that really want to know the kind of thing we're talking about today that need it. They need help, and help has a name, and his name is Jesus. And if you know him, you need to tell them. You need to introduce them to your friend. And I want you to start praying today and asking the Lord who that somebody might be and just vow, commit to love them and help them grow in their faith from now until Easter. And I'm asking you to take these cards and prayerfully consider these commitments over the next week. And if you come back next week, or even if you don't, you decide to do this, or you decide to do one or two of them. You can't do two or three if one's not there. If you don't have it going on this way, horizontal relationships aren't going to happen. You've got to have this, the vertical thing before you have this. And so if you commit to those, next week we're going to have an opportunity to talk about these again. But I want you to pray. I don't have to ask you to pray and tell me if you should do it. I know you should do it. Because the Bible says to do it. I'm just asking you to pray and think it through and let the Lord speak to you through this. What's he saying to you about this? Um, That's the commitment. Those are the commitments. So I want you to think about that. You're going to get this card on the way out. And I hope that somebody got something today that's going to change them. I um, got a phone call this morning and I've been sewing into the lives of a couple of loved ones who I won't read them to you now, but uh, just sewing into the life life of some very, very precious loved ones in my life and um, got a phone call from the mama of one of them this morning and I stopped for an hour to talk to her because people are more important to Jesus in preparation to teach the word. And and so I talked with her and in tears, just like, Jesus, we've been sewing the word of God over this child and over her life and and believing you and you and you did it. We we got we got a yes. We didn't get it the way we wanted it, but we got a yes. And it's good. It's good. I got a, a text from a friend a couple of days ago and she told me she was taking a big scary step today. And um I just texted her and I said, um, I'm proud of you and it's a it's a first step, but it's a giant leap of faith for you. And it's a giant answer to prayers that I've had and others have had for you for a long, long time. We've been sowing the Word of God over you and into you through prayer. So, that's it. The rest is up to Jesus and you. Let's pray. I'm going to pray this over you. Um, just something that I have in a, um, a book at home. Oh, Father, I pray for faith to believe that you rule the world in truth, justice, and love. I pray for faith to believe that if I seek first your kingdom and righteousness, you will provide for my needs. Faith, not to be anxious about tomorrow, but to believe that the love you have given me in the past will continue in the future. Faith to see your loving purpose unfold in all that is happening in our time. Faith to be calm and brave in the face of any dangers I might meet while doing my duty. Faith to believe in the power of your love to melt my hard heart and totally remove my sin. Faith to put my own trust in love rather than in force when other people harden their hearts against me. Faith to believe in the ultimate victory of your Holy Spirit over disease and death and all the powers of darkness. Faith to learn from any sufferings that you call me to endure. Faith to love and to leave in your hands the welfare of all my dear ones. Lord, all my ancestors were justified in their trust in you. Rid my heart of all pointless anxieties and paralyzing fears. Give me a cheerful and buoyant spirit and peace in doing your will. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. Have a good rest of the week. We'll see you next week.